everybody to have access to this afterward. So welcome everyone to the 12th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme, Supporting Businesses in a Time of Crisis. I'm Will Pino, I'm the Chief Executive of the Chamber. Today we are partnering with Dentons to provide you with expert legal advice on the topic, work permits and other immigration considerations during COVID-19. This webinar is being held to provide information and legal guidance to businesses and individuals on the current regulations governing work permits, permanent residency applications, and other immigration matters, especially in the context of the pandemic. The session will include information on labor law considerations and COVID-19 specific issues being faced by employers, practical considerations when filing work permit applications, liaising with work, permanent residency applications and the point system, and filing during the shelter in place restrictions. Our presenter and panelist for today's meeting is Len DeVries. Len is Senior Associate and Head of Local Practice at Denton's. His practice focuses on immigration, real estate, intellectual property, and corporate law. Len moved to the Cayman Islands in 2008 after being admitted to the South African Bar and practicing as an attorney and conveyancer in the High Court of South Africa in 2006 and as a notary in 2008. He was admitted as an attorney at law in the Cayman Islands in May 2015 and as a Cayman Islands notary public in 2018. He is particularly involved in immigration matters including residency applications, trademark registrations, all areas of conveyancing practicing, practice, drafting, and review of the commercial and private contractual agreements, preparate, preparing of, preparation of wills and probate matters, company registrations and related business licensing. In 2015 and 2016, he was named as the recommended professional and in intellectual property in the Cayman Islands by global law experts. And in 2015, he was awarded excellence in IP law Cayman Islands by Corporate Livewire's 2015 Legal Awards. His qualifications include a master's degree in public law. He holds a number of certif certificates on intellectual property and I IP management, mediation, anti-money laundering, and has completed the STEP certificate in international trust management. So before I hand over to Len, let me remind you that you may submit questions during the presentation via the chat feature. We will also be having our usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation, at which time Len and myself will respond to your questions. So we'll be taking your questions during the segment. So you just have to raise your hand at the end of the, the, the presentation. At the, it's at the bottom of your screen and that allows you to indicate that you wish to ask a question and at which time I'll bring up your, uh, you on the screen and unmute your mic. So thank you very much for, for the, joining us on this presentation and I'll hand it over to Len who will take us through his presentation. Good morning everybody and uh, thanks Will for the card introduction. I, I really do appreciate it. And um, today, we are going to, speaking, uh, to be speaking a little bit about immigration, obviously, uh, but the first thing I want to tell you is just what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and what local practice entails, um, because that is, uh, uh, you know, law can sometimes be a big scary thing, but local practice really involves uh, somebody walking in through our doors and uh, being one of you, uh, one of those individuals that set up a new business uh, that's got a great idea and trying to figure out how to get it up from the ground running. So let's say, for example, uh, you have a great, a great idea, you want to set up a business, we as Dentons will help you incorporate the company. We will assist you in uh, drafting the corporate resolutions, the contracts, the shareholders agreements, everything that goes with that. 
And obviously, once you've got a structure, uh, you need to make sure that that structure is legally allowed to operate. In order to do so, you need to uh, have a business license. And as you guys will be aware, um, you need to then approach the Department of Commerce or an investment. You need to approach SEMA. You need to approach the Health Practice Council, the relevant authority, in order to make sure that you are properly licensed to uh, do business in the Cayman Islands. Once you've got that, then obviously we start looking at the rest of your business. Uh, if you are having, if you've got a physical premises, we will assist with the lease agreement. If you are purchasing a property, we will deal with the conveyance in order to transfer that property over and set up this entire business and that structure in that way. So, uh, what we um, what we do what we do on that basis is to uh, then start looking at the the people that work with that business itself and you do have a a very varied workforce as we know uh, there are Kamanians, there are a tremendous amount of work permit holders on island there are people who uh, work uh, who have residency uh, there are people who are persons of independent means and all of these people fit into the islands and a lot of them f uh, have to slot into specific types of businesses and we need to make sure that that is properly regulated and we need to make sure that they hold the correct permits and are correct licenses in order to do so and that's where our firm very much uh, comes into play and that's where my team as the local practice team uh, comes into play i've got a fantastic team that works with me and we do uh, deal with uh, a tremendous amount of applications every single year for uh, all kinds of organi organizations and individuals. Anything from, you know, one single domestic helper permit for um, uh, somebody uh, all the way through to massive conglomerates with hundreds of permit holders and we do manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, and today's topic obviously falls under the Chamber's uh, general considerations, which is uh, the supporting businesses in a time of crisis. That is a general topic that um, we are dealing with right now. And um, that will go hand in hand. I trust everybody can see my screen right now. I've got the PowerPoint presentation up. And today's discussion specifically is going to be um, about immigration and transitioning from the Department of Immigration over to Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman. There's been a, a tremendous amount of changes over the last year and a half and I do want to take the time just to take all of us a step back and explain where we've come from uh, ever since work has been introduced to the islands and where we are going and what the changes have been uh, since uh, this was introduced. But before we can do that, we need to have a look at a couple of labor law considerations. You can't have a workforce, obviously, uh, without having um, uh, employees. And employees are entitled to certain rights. And uh, those employees are entitled to contracts and it needs to be properly regulated. And we do have the uh, labor law that does deal with that. Um, and there's a couple of things that I'm just going to touch upon very, very briefly. Today is obviously focused a lot on immigration topics and immigration law. Um, so I'm not going to bore you to death with the labor law considerations. This has been dealt with and there is a tremendous amount of resources out there. Uh, but there are things that you do need to bear in mind as we move through the different levels of uh, lockdown and as restrictions are uh, relaxed a little bit over time. The first thing that I want to uh, talk about is just which responsibilities employers have towards their employees. And, um, you know, employee-employer relations are governed by common law and legislation in the Cayman Islands. And uh, the responsibilities that are owed by employers to their employees can be identified by looking at the individual employment contract. As you are uh, all aware, uh, the law does require that the rights and responsibilities of the employee be outlined in writing. Um, uh, the law refers to it as a letter of employment. And there is a duty of care towards your employees in relation to health and safety, which is obviously of um, paramount con uh, consideration and importance nowadays. And, the uh, law and regulations in Cayman requires that all non-essential businesses be closed, as we're aware right now, and that if necessary, the employees work remotely from home. Uh, we've all been uh, part of this for the last uh, six to eight weeks. 
It's crucial that all non-essential businesses ensure that their workplaces are closed to all employees and where businesses remain open, employee, employers must ensure that social distancing measures are put in place and must adhere to the rules regarding opening hours and maximum gatherings. A mandatory distance of six feet, as we know, must be implemented between all employees and its employer's responsibility, its employer's responsibility to ensure that strict hygiene measures are followed. The Department of Labor and Pensions urges employers and employees alike to follow the guidelines um, outlined by Dr. John Lee, the Chief Medical Officer. We've all been looking at the press briefings over time. We are uh, very, very aware of uh, Dr. Lee and all the fantastic guidance that has been provided. Employers are also encouraged to ensure workers that the involving situation is being monitored closely and that steps are being taken to avoid unnecessary disruption to their employment. Businesses should regularly uh, circulate the most up-to-date advice regarding infection prevention as a matter of best practice. The provisions of the law relating to, uh, to safety in the workplace do still apply. That's very important. Part 8 of the law entitled Health, Safety and Welfare at Work states that every employer shall ensure, so far as reasonably practical, the health, safety and welfare of wor at work of his or her employees. And section 59 of the law requires that employees are provided with suitable and sanitary conveniences. Employers must therefore ensure that employees have access to hand sanitizers, washing facilities in order to prevent uh, the spread of the virus. And uh, employers must also make sure that every workplace is kept in a clean slate. This is uh, of particular importance during this period of risk. We've seen what's happened over the last few um, uh, weeks uh, as we've received reports of one or two um, uh, stores uh, that had staff uh, that tasted positive and they took very quick and very um, uh, decisive action in order to sanitize and make sure that the public at large and the rest of their staff are protected. The governor of the islands has the power to make regulations prescribing safety measures uh, and um, uh, obviously that is a very powerful function that the uh, governor can uh, deploy as and when needed. And uh, employers also have a duty of care, not just towards their uh, employees, but also towards some um, other individuals and contractors and visitors to your premises. And uh, employers must take reasonable care to ensure that no uh, person is endangered by their actions. In the context of this viral outbreak, this means that you as employer must reasonably uh, use common sense to take measures that will protect other individuals, such as you know, following the government advice, working remotely and conducting meetings via uh, telephone and video calls only. We also know about um, the mask policies and so that's been implemented uh, of late. Uh, so do uh, take notice of that and make sure that uh, you strictly adhere to all the regulations and guidelines that are provided. Employment contracts itself. Um, should employers have to close down a business or if revenues decrease due to a reduced output, they will still be obliged to pay their employees and abide by the rules relating to termination by notice contained in the law. Employers are advised to review the individual employment contract in order to ascertain whether the contract allows to temporarily lay off or reduce their hours. And in the islands, the travel and tourism industry, as we know, are particularly important and also particularly vulnerable to the economic effects of the virus outbreak. There's uh, a number of businesses that have been uh, long established and have been in the islands for a very, very long time that shut their doors uh, lately, and uh, I'm sure it won't be uh, the last. And should it become necessary to close the business or to reduce employee pay and hours, um, it is very important that employers let the employees know as soon as possible and obtain their consent to any changes to their employment uh, contracts. There's been um, a small change to the labor law and the labor regulations of late as well. Uh, that does allow for the temporary layoff of employees. Um, it used to be uh, that uh, Ed, if the date of recall of an employee that was uh, laid off temporarily was uh, less than or more than 30 days, then certain redundancy payments kicked in. That has now been pushed back to 60 days, and there are certain other provisions that apply to employees that work in a construction sector. Um, 
I'm not going to delve into that uh, too much, but definitely realize and think about the labor law considerations because that is always tied into the individual that has a permit or that is um, otherwise working for you. Now, Dentons, um, as a firm, we are physically, <laughs> we are the world's largest law firm. And that comes with a tremendous amount of benefits. And uh, in order to assist um, our clients globally and locally here in the Cayman Islands, uh, we have uh, we very quickly mobilized and started working on um, a, a hub, uh, specifically a coronavirus hub. Um, that uh, relates to uh, all the issues that employers are facing. And I will definitely recommend that you guys go and check it out. And it, it is very, very similar uh, to uh, what the Chamber of Commerce have put together specifically for the Cayman Islands uh, itself. And there are webinars, there are uh, specific guidance notes, and um, you know we've got the benefit of a very, very large workforce, 10,000 attorneys worldwide, 19,000 people, more than 180 offices in 75 countries. The amounts are staggering, and with that comes a tremendous knowledge base and the ability to react very quickly and to provide people with um, some assurances and assistance. Uh, this is just a quick example that I took as a screenshot. It is continuously updated, um, but as you can see, we've got insolvency trackers. We deal with issues like force majeure and contracts, and so that are um, affected by that. We are dealing with data privacy. There was a webinar about data privacy here, uh, uh, hosted by the Chamber a few weeks back as well. Real estate and construction, labor and um, employment, and a lot of you, have businesses that are not just in the Cayman Islands, um, but have footprints across the entire world and across the entire Caribbean. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if you don't, I will still encourage you to just go check that out and see how other countries are reacting and what sort of advice is out there. We are continuously updating it. As we all know, here in Cayman, new regulations were published just last week uh, to govern the um, changes to lockdown and so, and we uh, are actively moving from the reactive approach initially when uh, the lockdowns were implemented to starting to look towards the future and what needs to be done in order to reopen. And the new normal is a terrible term and I'm not going to use the new normal, but um, to move back to where we were and to ensure that everybody is operating as efficiently and as um, uh, smoothly as possible. Today's topic, the main, main topic we are going to be dealing with today is the immigration framework. And it's been, it's been an interesting time over the last year and a half or so. And uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about where to pitch this and how to explain what has happened over the last year and a half and who we are now dealing with. And uh, truly the best way from a legal point of view to do that is to take a step back and look at the legislation and the regulations that govern this entire framework and what it is that are uh, taken into consideration by the board and by the director of work, um, how they uh, approve applications, what passes through their minds and what it is that needs to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. Previously, we had the Department of Immigration, and the Department of Immigration um, has uh, transitioned into Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, but this hasn't been a once-off, today we are the Department of Immigration, tomorrow we are work process. There have been a tremendous amount of transitional provisions, and this all started back in February already, and it's been a, a gradual rollout, and we are getting there. We are very, very close to having uh, everything operate fully and efficiently as possible. Obviously, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has sped up some of that and has uh, led to a few logistical issues. And I'm going to just touch upon each one of these laws very briefly to explain to you why it's there and what it says and um, uh, where we go with it from there. Uh, obviously, 
you know, we have it's some 300 people that signed in today. There's a tremendous amount of uh, people and every single one of you uh, have a different story and a different approach and um, different immigration issues that apply to your personal circumstances. Uh, the only way that I can cover every single circumstance is to physically read the law from front to back, but we will be here until next week. And um, so I'm going to touch upon a few things. Um, the first one is the immigration transition law. And this is, it's physically a beast, as you guys can <laughs> see, uh, it's a biggie. And this is the one that transitioned from the Department of Immigration over to Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman. And the areas of law that it covers, it deals with labor training and development. It establishes work, it establishes um, the powers of work, the powers of the director, directions by cabinet. Um, it deals with the boards and their duties. Uh, this piece of legislation um, specifically sets out what the work permit boards um, can do and what, what falls under their scope, the Commandian Status and Permanent Residency Board. Um, the, uh, it deals with provisions relating to Kamanians. Uh, you know, people acquire Kamanian status over time. People are, are uh, born to Kamanian parents and all of that needs to be regularized and all of that needs to be properly governed. And that's set out in this law specifically. It also deals with permanent residence and extended residence categories. Uh, those are applicants that have um, uh, been on island for more than eight years. The classic permanent residency applications like uh, we deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and that most of us know very, very well and that I'm going to uh, touch upon a little bit later, but it also deals with other types of residency applications. Um, people who hold a certificate of permanent residence for permanent uh, persons of independent means. Uh, you get 25 year uh, grants uh, where somebody doesn't have the right to work. You get lifetime grants where somebody is a person of independent means, but they can get the right to work. Uh, there's certificates of direct investment. Uh, there are um, persons uh, with substantial business presence and depending on the type of business you have and uh, depending on your role within that business it might be that one of those sorts of categories are more appropriate to you as an individual compared to a classic work permit specifically. Um, it also deals with, and you know, for today's purposes, gainful occupation of non commandians that is um, work permits and the way in which work permits are governed specifically. Um, and then there are general provisions uh, that we see in just about every law, which deals with uh, uh, enforcement, it deals with marriages of convenience, regulations, offenses, all of those sorts of things that um, um, makes this tick. And there are two uh, important definitions that I want to highlight in this law. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. But under the immigration transition law itself, they define a work permit as any type of permit, including a temporary work permit granted under Section 63, which deals with the uh, physical approval of these types of permits. Um, it also defines a temporary work permit really as uh, a, grant, a permit granted to allow a person to enter and remain in the islands temporarily for a period of less than a year for the purposes of gainful occupation. And this is different to the temporary work permits as we know it, the three month permit and a six month permit. That is, was, and these provisions were included in this law and this law came into effect in February last year. But very quickly during that period, um, we needed to provide certain transitional provisions and we needed to make sure that temporary work permits as we know it, as well as business visitor permits are properly dealt with and that we can continue dealing with those and continue issuing those in the usual fashion while uh, the, the law is fully implemented and the necessary support structures are um, put into place. The law also has, and I'm going to circle back to this later, uh, something referred to as considerations when determining a work permit. And that's set out in section 58 of the law. There's a reason why I'm going to circle back to it, and that is because it, this um, section of the law was changed under the amendment legislation recently um, uh, following the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, 
it, there is a tremendous amount of things that weigh on the minds of the board and a tremendous amount of things that immigration need to consider or rather shall I say work need to consider when they look at every single permit application. A permit application isn't just a bunch of papers that's thrown up into the air and whatever they catch gets approved. This is a very, very well structured system and it really does um, set out the rules and requirements and everything that does need to be considered. And I'm hoping by the time we're done today, all of you will really understand this and realize what it is we're dealing with on a day to day basis and the sort of considerations that the board does need to uh, bear in mind. Um, as I briefly alluded to uh, a moment ago, the Immigration Transition Temporary Work Permit and visitor, Business Visitor Permit Regulations, um, those were um, brought out uh, last year as well. And um, those are the ones that deal specifically with BVPs and temporary work permits because the um, law itself, the transition law, didn't uh, deal with it in the classic sense um, as we used to know it under the old immigration law. Now, a business visitor permit, um, for those of you that don't know what a BVP is, those are applications for people who don't necessarily fall under the uh, the requirements for a, a normal work permit, where a six-month work permit or a three-month work permit might not be entirely appropriate, but it's people who um, also doesn't necessarily fall under the requirements for a visitor work permit or alternatively an exemption, uh, the 10-day exemption that you can get under the law. This uh, we see deployed most often for visiting professionals, specifically uh, doctors in a medical industry. Um, uh, you know, as an island, uh, we have an uh, unbelievably good healthcare system, but from time to time we do want to see specialists and they do want to travel to the islands uh, to come see patients. And uh, in these instances, you can make a single application once per year and specify the number of uh, visits you'd like uh, during the course of the year. And the, uh, uh, the person whose permit, the BVP, has been approved can then, uh, depending on the amount of time that's specified, up to 14 days, come and visit and uh, come deal with things. Typically, we will see, for example, a visiting a doctor attend the island once per month for a week or so to see patients before um, uh, flying back off island again. Uh, it also deals with seasonal workers, which is essentially a temporary work permit uh, holder, but it can be granted for up to uh, eight months at a time, but it can't be renewed and there's certain restrictions to that. And it deals with temporary work permits in the classic sense, uh, work permits as we know it, the three month and six month work permits. Regulation um, four under these regulations sets out the criteria when determining work permits. And I'm going to go over all the criteria uh, briefly right now, just so you know what it is that the board are looking at every single time an application is filed. So a, um, a work permit um, in these regulations can be granted for um, you know, a, a period of up to six months um, and uh, it can't be and it can be renewed uh, so long as the period of validity does not exceed six months. And then, it, like I said, a seasonal worker can be granted for a continuous period of eight months um, and such permit, permit cannot be extended or renewed and nor may a work permit be issued with respect to the same worker unless that person has left the islands for at least three months immediately following the uh, expiry of the temporary permit for that seasonal worker. Obviously, we see that a lot in the um, tourism industry where you have people coming in during a high season and then leaving again. When it comes to the criteria that the um, a board and that um, work need to consider, for every single employee and for every single employer, in relation to the specific employer, they need to uh, have demonstrated that the prospective employer has a genuine need to engage the services of the prospective worker. And then in relation to the worker, um, they consider the worker's character, reputation and health, and where relevant the character, reputation and health of the worker's dependents. And if the worker is a professional and um, has technical qualifications, they also um, look at the experience and competence to undertake the specific uh, role. And they also look at the economic and social benefits which the worker may bring to the islands. 
the sufficiency of the resources or the proposed salary of the worker and where the worker's spouse is employed within the islands, those of the spouse and the worker or spouse's ability to adequately maintain their dependents. We do see a lot of applications um, for dependents or if a child is born uh, to have that child added as a dependent and the resources and the ability to maintain and live and uh, take care of your family is paramount. The board is not just going to approve a permit simply because you had a child. Um, there are considerations they need to make sure that you will not become destitute um, uh, because of it. They also look at the workers' facility and the use of the English language. As we know, the uh, English language tests and uh, people do need to be able to communicate on Ireland and then the location type and suitability of the accommodation available for the worker. These are all the things that we see in the permit applications itself. When you fill out an application and you complete the accommodation form or when you tick the box and uh, complete how much you are going to earn and whether or not you um, will be bringing your dependents along, it's not because they are nosy, it is because it is set out in the law and you do need to um, provide those details because it uh, falls under the criteria. What is important, and we're going to see it in the um, law itself, is the protection of local interests, and in particular of Kamanians, including and where applicable the provisions set out in Section 58.2 of the law. Um, we're going to circle back to that part of the law, but certainly during this time and as there are more and more businesses that may be negatively impacted by the virus, we will definitely see the protection of local interests be even more at the forefront of the decision makers' minds. And they also need to look at the availability of the services of a suitable person already legally and ordinarily in islands. Um, the desirability of granting permits to applicants with different backgrounds and from different geographical areas so that a suitable balance in the social and economic life of the islands may be maintained. We have over time seen the board come back and say, uh, we note that you are hiring a tremendous amount of people from jurisdiction X. Why is that? And why are you not focusing on other jurisdictions as well? Because demographics is important. Um, and there are um, additional uh, provisions set out in section 60. Um, they do look at the requirements of the community of a whole, or as a whole, and then um, any other matters that might arise from the application. Obviously, if somebody ticks a box that they've got a previous conviction or anything like that, then those matters are obviously considered um, and at the forefront of their minds. Incidentally, Regulation 6 and these regulations are very similar to Regulation 6 in the Immigration Regulations itself as well, and that deals with training and recruitment. And the Board of the Director may require an applicant for the grant or renewal of a permit to provide details of any program um, that the applicant has that's designed to ensure that commandians are provided with the instructions and practical experience necessary to make them fully qualified to carry out the job concerns satisfactorily and as expeditiously as possible. If you hear somebody casually in um, our business say there's a Reg 6 attached to the permit, it's because of this. We are referring to Regulation 6 and we, we are referring to these uh, training plans and um, all the requirements that go hand in hand with that in order to individual to uh, identify a particular individual for that role and make sure that they are properly trained um, for that particular role. The next one we're going to touch upon is the Immigration Regulations 2019 revision. And there's a little note on there saying it's partially in force. And that is because the Immigration Regulations, uh, the 2019 revision, uh, that was uh, originally published under the old immigration law, under the Immigration Law 2015 revision. As we know, uh, we are now dealing with the Immigration Transition Law 2018 for uh, permits and all those types of applications. But there were transitional provisions built into the Immigration Transition Law to make sure that um, these regulations still remain in force and we are still able to use them, or at least parts of them, in order to make sure that we can carry on with the day-to-day -day business of uh, dealing with work permits and so. Immigration regulations support legislation. Primary re legislation typically passed through the House. It's, uh, it goes through the Legislative Assembly. Uh, it gets approved. It gets assented to by the governor. It passes into law. And there is a full debate process. It goes through various readings and stages. 
whereas regulations are typically a little bit easier in, uh, in order to um, implement, uh, but more so regulations are there to deal with the nuts and bolts of applications on a day-to-day -day basis. It sets out the uh, criteria, it sets out what you need to complete and the supporting documentation and so that you need to file. The regulations, for example, is where we find the work permit fees um, that are attached to each and every uh, occupation and each and every industry. It's obviously not a comprehensive list and there are times when we need to reach out to work and have them make a determination based on a particular title and the scope of work in order to determine what that permits fees are going to be. Now certain provisions uh, of the uh, regulations were repealed and they now form part of the Customs and Border Control Law and we're going to move on to that um, year after. And the Customs and Border Control Law took over some of the old responsibilities of work. A lot of you would uh, reach out to us and say but I went to immigration and uh, I wanted to do X, Y and Z without necessarily realizing but it isn't the old immigration, it's not work that is dealing with those particular things anymore as it's now been transitioned to uh, customs and border control. The um, regulations, uh, as I said, they help to implement a given law and uh, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the things that they do cover in the regulations. So uh, it deals with applications for work permits, endorsements on work permits, again regulation 6, training and um, recruitment. Uh, it's got regulation 9 that focuses on the responsibility of an employer to notify uh, work of a cessation of employment. You're not allowed to have somebody uh, stop working for you but keep their permit open as it were, in order to allow them to carry on being on islands. Uh, there is a requirement under the regulations to um, notify work as soon as possible. It also deals with certain exemptions from the requirements of work permits. There are specific types of um, matters for which you can come to the islands up to uh, uh, 10 days without needing a work permit. And it frequently deals with um, people that are coming here from educational establishments or people that are here to testify in court, um, those sorts of things. People who work for a manufacturer and they need to come here to uh, deal with uh, the installation of equipment and so in order to maintain a warranty and they're going to be here very briefly and they might be exempt from the regulations. Um, it also sets out a financial standing for uh, people who hold residential certificates for persons of independent means, for example. If you are somebody that are on island and you've invested more than $2 million, um, then you might be entitled to an application for a certificate of person of independent means. And um, together with that, you can make an application for the right to work. And it looks at those specific frameworks and amount of money uh, you need to invest in real estate and um, uh, in local investments in order to be able to make those applications. Similarly with uh, persons so of substantial business presence, um, there are certain types of businesses uh, if you are in a managerial role and it's a business that forms part of a certain industry then you might have an option to apply for a certain type of residence certificate that isn't necessarily the same um, as a normal work permit. The fees are set out. Schedule 2 to the regulations deals with the point system for um, uh, permanent residency applications, your eight-year grant, and we're going to go into that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail later on. It deals with business staffing plans. Every uh, business that has 15 or more um, employees need to have a business staffing plan, and then it also deals with residency and employment rights certificates and uh, the matters that relate to that. The next one I'm going to touch upon is the Customs and Border Control Law. And the Customs and Border uh, Control Law, many of the previous matters we've now already dealt with under the immigration law are now in the CBC law. Um, and it sets out the responsibilities of the uh, director of uh, the CBC, Customs and Border Control. Um, and th there's a general overview. As we know, customs is massive. The scope of what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis um, is tremendous. It's not just your um, FedEx parcel uh, that got you know, stuck. Uh, it's not just uh, dealing with those sorts of things. At the end of the day, uh, they look at the control of vessels and goods. They look at the duties of the director. They look at 
um, the collection of duty and package taxes, the warehouses to re relate to all of that. Obviously, hand in hand with that are contraventions and penalties um, uh, for evading duty, for smuggling, for um, being engaged in smuggling. Uh, a lot of very uh, exciting stuff that we can't go into today, but uh, it makes for very interesting reading. Uh, important for us is the entry and landing of persons. Um, CBC are in charge of the entry and landing of persons, and those are the officers that meet and greet you when you uh, pass through the airport. And they, uh, this particular law looks at the requirements that are to be satisfied by visitors and the provisions relating to sponsors for those visitors and the removal of persons who are um, unlawfully in the islands. Um, there are some transitional provisions uh, that we're going to touch upon briefly as well when we look at the le post COVID legislation um, that deals specifically with all of that. Um, but bear in mind, a lot of this falls with Customs and Border Control at this point in time as well. They also deal with the asylum and deportation issues. Um, but for our purposes, uh, it's important to know that they're the ones dealing with uh, visitors arriving on the islands. And if you have an employee uh, whose work permit is up, uh, then they need to be what we call regular, oh, regularized. And uh, in order to do so, they need to get uh, a visitor stamp. Uh, immigration or other work needs to be notified um, and the CBC will need to uh, process it and then they need to make sure that that person is legally and ordinarily uh, on island and is it still allowed to be here and they will grant them um, permission to be here for a certain period of time depending on their personal circumstances and uh, the supporting documentation so that they do provide. The next one that's, um, uh, that I allude to over here is Customs and Border Control Amendment Law of 2019. Uh, for our purposes, so this was published in January of this year, but it's not important for today, you'll be glad to know. Um, it deals with administrative fines, penalties, tickets, those sorts of things, and some of the uh, logistical issues that CBC have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one that is important is the Customs and Border Control Visa Entry and Landing Regulations. This one um, drills down a little bit more into um, some of the visa requirements. And this was specifically taken out of the old immigration regulations, the 2019 revision uh, that I mentioned earlier is partially in force. Um, it used to be found in Europe, but it's been taken out. And it deals with a list of countries that do or do not require a visa. If you've got somebody coming from uh, the uh, from a different country, then uh, you can physically look up over here whether or not uh, there are visa requirements that needs to be met and what sort of exemptions may or may not apply. Um, for our purposes, what is um, important is a visitor work visa. Um, it's a relatively new concept uh, that was introduced over the last few years. And it's Customs and Border Control that handles this. It's not work that handles this. And a visitor work visa, uh, it applies to a person except a professional employee. If professional employees are set out and the, their definition are set out in the uh, immigration transition law. Um, and other than a person who's ineligible for the grant of a work permit. So if you, uh, for some reason, aren't allowed to get a work permit, you're not gonna be able to get away with getting a visitor work visa. Um, uh, by virtue of section 66.1. And section 66 of the law relates to term limits. So if somebody um, passed their term limit, you can't immediately next week get visitor work visas for them to come here because there is a, uh, it's supposed to be a break. Now somebody like that who is employed full-time by a company, individual in institution outside of the islands, and is coming to the islands for up to five calendar days, for the purpose of engaging in commercial activity with one or more persons or entities licensed to trade in the islands under trade and business uh, law or any other law, like we know SEMA or the health practice law, would otherwise, and to, would otherwise require a work permit for the activity referred to in subparagraph B and is being sponsored in accordance with paragraph B and may apply um, to an officer upon arrival at a port of entry for the grant of a visitor work visa. Typically, these uh, visitor work visa applications are filed uh, in advance 
and we notify Customs and Border Control. Um, and um, there is a $100 fee that's attached uh, to that particular visa and uh, they can then come in and uh, be here and work for up to five uh, calendar days. What is important when it comes to visit and work visas is um, they must not be a prohibited immigrant. And excuse me, um, they also need to possess a valid entry visa. Now, a valid entry visa is important because just because you get a visitor work visa does not mean you're exempt from the usual visa requirements um, for depending on which country you are coming from. And uh, important as well, a person may not hold more than one visitor work visa for the same sponsor or sponsors in the same calendar month. Because a visitor work visa is relatively cheap compared to perhaps some other types of applications uh, at only $100, uh, obviously, what we don't want to see is people trying to abuse the system by um, bringing uh, somebody in Monday through Friday every single week for a hundred bucks and essentially treat them like a normal permit holder. A visitor work visa is uh, really typically applied for uh, by uh, furniture, uh, by people who come in for uh, to do a very specific job for a very um, short period of time, and it is um, at the discretion of Customs and Border Control to review and approve those. Um, the next one we're going to quickly touch upon, uh, and the last one on the primary pre-COVID-19 legislation is the Customs and Border Control Money Declarations and Disclosures Regulations. Uh, those were also published in February last year. And uh, luckily for us, this is not something that's important for today's discussion. It deals with money coming in and going out and the disclosures that go hand in hand with that reporting, anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, and the um, uh, rights and responsibilities that tie to all of that. So it's not something I'm gonna bore you to death with. Um, do bear in mind when it comes to this legislation and the documents that listed over here, this is not a comprehensive list. The last uh, number of years has seen a tremendous amount of orders and directions and various publications, but this really is the core stuff that we deal with as lawyers on a day-to-day -day basis. Moving on to uh, the next slide, the recent changes to the law and regulations. And um, there's four really important ones that's been published um, since the COVID-19 crisis kicked in. And the first one of that is the Immigration Transition Amendment Law. And this one ties into the Immigration Transition Law itself, that law that replaced the Immigration Law. And um, it's, it's important. And this one, I'm going to physically go over the various changes that's been made. And there are certain transitional provisions in it as well that may or may not apply to uh, your employees and what you've been doing since uh, the end of March when all of this started. And this ties into section 58 of the uh, considerations for an application for a work permit by the board. And I'm going to just jump between all of them, give me a second. So section 58 of the law uh, deals with the considerations for the application of a work permit by the board. We're now talking about work permits and work permit grants and no longer talking about the temporary work permits that um, we spoke about earlier under the other regulations. However, most of these considerations are um, uh, cross each other's paths and as we know, uh, temporary work permits do fall under the scope of work permits under this law. So uh, look at this in terms of any sort of permit you are busy dealing with right now. And um, the, the boards, uh, we've got the work permit board, the business staffing plan, plan board, the Cayman Bracken, Little Cayman immigration board, and the uh, director of workforce opportunities and residency Cayman, uh, Mr. Jeremy Scott. Um, the matters they uh, shall take into consideration when it comes to um, applications is that the prospective employer has demonstrated the prospective employer's genuine need to engage the services of the prospective worker. And then they changed it and they implemented recently a change to subsection two, which says the prospective employer um, shall, unless the employer has been exempted by cabinet 
or the board or by, by the director registered the vacancy to which the application relates in an electronic portal established and managed by work for 14 days before the submission of the application in order to ascertain the availability of any one or more of the following in the order in which they are listed. And those are Kamanians, the holders of residency and employment rights certificates under section 37.5 and uh, 16, those are, uh, and uh, section 38, those are your permanent residents or people who are um, the spouses of permanent residents. Um, and um, <sighs> this is important because uh, it requires advertisement of every single permit and publication of every single permit on an established portal for at least 14 days before you file the application. And since uh, these um, this amendment laws come into effect, we now know that that portal is Jobs Cayman. We are, have moved away from the NWDA and uh, Jobs Cayman is now the go-to place. So if you have not registered yet, please do so as soon as possible. This law came into effect um, on the 1st of May. Um, and then cabinet shall also buy notice in the Gazette in a, or any other government, uh, official government website, publish details of the electronic portal. As I just said, that is Jobs Cayman. The link to that can be found on the work.ky website. And then they state that a prospective employer, in addition to registering an application under subsection two, which is Jobs Cayman, may also at the same time as registration advertise the vacancy in local newspaper or other prescribed media. What this means for you on a day-to-day -day basis is that newspaper advertisements are no longer mandated. It's not mandatory. You don't have to publish in a newspaper. However, you must publish every single application on Jobs Cayman. And we are going to look later on when we deal with the amendment regulations about the nuts and bolts of how you deal with uh, advertisements that are posted both in local newspapers and on Jobs Cayman. Then um, the next part is the um, board or the director will, uh, in the case of an application in respect of a professional, managerial or skilled occupation, um, as the case may be, uh, they need to be satisfied as to the extent to which the prospective employer has established adequate training or scholarship programs for Kamanians. This again ties back into regulation six, uh, where it comes to having a proper um, uh, training program and contingency programs in place. In relation to the individual themselves, it's very similar to what we've seen previously. They look at the character, reputation, and the health, and where relevant the character, reputation, and the health of the dependents of the worker. They look at the professional and technical qualifications and um, their experience and the competence to undertake the position applied for. Again, they look at the economic and social benefits which the worker may bring to the islands. Um, they may look at the sufficiency of the resources or the proposed salary of the worker and where the worker's spouse is employed within the islands, those of the worker's spouse um, and their dependents. All these things we spoke about earlier, uh, looking at the uh, English language, look at uh, the suitability of the accommodation for that worker uh, once they do arrive on island. There are general considerations so that the board needs to take into uh, account and we do genuinely expect these considerations to uh, feature a lot more prominently um, going forward, especially as the dynamics of the workforce uh, changes and as we might see more uh, people uh, be out of a job in the short term. And those are generally the protection of local interests and in particular, Kamanians, including with out limitation where applicable to provisions under Section 582C. Um, the availability of the services of a suitable person already legally and ordinarily uh, resident in the islands. And importantly as well, the requirements of the community as a whole, the demographics referred to in 30J and other matters that may arise from the application. So local interests and the requirements of the uh, community as a whole is going to be uh, first and foremost going forward as well uh, when it comes to considering these applications as it's always been. Um, the next change that they made to um, section 58 is important because they deleted the word willfully and um, section 58.5 uh, deals with a person uh, with the 
issues when it comes to liability and convictions. And a person who, when making an application under Section 56, which is the permit application, um, to the board or the director withholds information that a Kamanian, the spouse of a Kamanian or the holder of a residency and employment rights certificate has applied for the position uh, for which the permit is sought or provides inaccurate or incomplete information with, with respect to that paragraph in an attempt to deceive the board, um, either by an act or omission, commits an offence and is liable on summary conviction in respect of the first offence to a fine of $20,000 and to imprisonment for one year. And in respect of the second offence, that's $30,000 and imprisonment for two years. This is important. They remove the word willfully. Previously, a person when making an application uh, to the board, if they willfully withheld them uh, information that a companion or somebody like that applied, um, then these offences apply. Removing that word essentially turns this into uh, a strict liability offense. It's a lot easier to prosecute. The, uh, the threshold to prove that you uh, did not consider all viable applicants is a lot lower right now. Um, so bear in mind, you do need to post on jobs came and you do need to make sure that every single viable applicant is properly considered. If they are not fit for the job, why? It needs to be properly set out and you need to engage with these people. Uh, you can't simply uh, say no to a viable applicant because there's a spelling mistake in their resume. That's not going to fly. They, you really do need to uh, consider it uh, properly. Uh, the next change, so there's a, a few other changes that's not important for today. And then uh, there is a change to section 72 uh, in the regulations, which is an interesting change. It, allow, it allows cabinet to um, uh, uh, have some of the regulations apply retrospectively if they feel that it's equi equitable. We haven't seen this deployed just yet, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, progresses over time. Um, however, the, the biggest change um, and the one that deals specifically with our provisions right now is the transitional provisions under this uh, amendment law. And the transitional provisions deal with all the issues that's uh, arisen now since the 27th of March and since uh, the lockdown really commenced. And um, Section 58.2 this, of this principal law, and this is the jobs came and requirement uh, specifically, shall not apply to an application by a prospective employer where the application is made before the date of commencement of this amending law. And uh, the application has not been determined at the date of commencement. Essentially, what this means is if you filed a work permit application before this amending law came into effect, then you'll find they are going to hear that application based on the law as it was in effect before this came into effect. However, all applications being filed right now and going forward need to comply with the changes in the law and need to be um, posted on jobs came in. Uh, this law was passed by the Legislative Assembly on the 23rd of April. It was assented to by the Governor on the 27th and uh, it was published in a gazette on the 1st of May. Uh, we looked at the interpretation law, we were of the opinion that it took effect on the 1st of May, and that date is of paramount importance to the next change that's been made. And where a worker's work permit expired on or after the 27th of March 2020, i.e. after these uh, provisions kicked in, and the employer or self-employed worker was or is unable due to the closure of work as a result of the pandemic to make an application for the renewal of the work permit or where the work permit was a temporary work permit to make an application for the grant of a work permit, the worker shall be deemed not to be committing an offence under the principal law and by continuing to work on the same terms and conditions of the expired work permit i.e. all of us uh, or you know all applicants that might have been on work permits since the 27th of March um, and uh, it might have expired they were fine to carry on working during this period um, uh, particularly as work was uh, for a period closed and they weren't able to accept applications. Um, however, um, uh, the, the employer or, or um, self-employed worker must make an application for the renewal of the work permit or in the case of a temporary work permit application for the grant of a work permit within 30 days of the commencement of this amending law. 
or with uh, in any other period by which um, this period is extended by cabinets, by notice published in a gazette. Um, and so uh, these transitional provisions essentially put a stopgap measure on people who have not been able to file their renewal uh, applications or their work permit grant applications when they were on temporary work permits. And that's a 30 day period that started running on the 1st of May. Or, uh, so <laughs> we've literally got one week left to make sure that you comply with the law, have your jobs properly posted on Jobs Cayman and get these permit applications submitted unless that 30 day period is extended. We are hopeful uh, that cabinet might extend it, but we have had no indications to that uh, effect. And as of right now, uh, there is a 30-day uh, window that's going to run out next week. And then subject to subsection 4, um, a right to continue working in accordance with subsection 2 shall continue until the determination of the application and any subsequent appeal. What this means is uh, if your work permit ran out, uh, since the 27th of March during this period and you file uh, the work permit renewal application before the 30-day uh, period is up, i.e. the end of next week, um, then you'll be fine to carry on working uh, until they determine it. Similar to uh, somebody filing a work permit renewal application under the old regulations um, before the previous one ran out. Then if after the expiration of the 30 day period or any period by which it is extended by cabinet and um, the work permit renewal application uh, or where the permit uh, is a temporary work permit a grant, if it has not been received by work, the worker shall not continue to work or to work for that employer. And when the worker continues employment with the employer, both the worker and the employer commits an offense and are liable on summary conviction to a fine of $5,000 or imprisonment to a year or both. Uh, meaning if these applications aren't properly filed by the end of next week, the workers need to stop working. Um, otherwise, um, you, uh, both the worker and the employer face a fine. And then where due to the, oh, there's a, a couple of additional provisions now dealing with permanent residency and PCWs. I'll circle back to that um, shortly. And there is a, another provision that states that where a worker's work permit expires on or after the 27th of March, these uh, specifically deal with um, workers whose permits ran out uh, since uh, the COVID struck. Um, and the worker's employment with the employer is ended after the expiration without a work permit being granted, or in the case of a temporary work permit, um, the work permit grant being filed. Um, neither the employer nor the worker shall be deemed to be in contravention of the principal law or this amending law if the worker continues to work on the same terms and conditions as those in the expired work permit in the period between the expiration and ending of the worker's employment. This is essentially an amnesty. This is essentially, you had a worker that, uh, whose permit, let's say, expired at, um, uh, in the middle of April, and they carried on working for you for the last month, but uh, due to operational considerations, you weren't able to um, maintain the business. The business is going to close. You're not going to file another work permit application. This is saying that people in those circumstances that work beyond their um, the time of the permit is not going to get into trouble for it. So that is um, important. The next one we're going to uh, touch upon uh, speaks specifically to our um, listeners who are in the medical field. This is the um, Immigration Transition uh, Work Permit Exemptions Regulations of 2020. Um, so those of you that are not, bear with me, but it, all, it still makes for interesting reading. Um, and this, makes, uh, this provides for exemptions to certain parts of the law itself. And this is very COVID-19 specific. Um, it, initially, uh, we had no idea how big this was going to be and what the scope is and how the resources of the health services industry was going to be taxed as a result of it. And there are work permit considerations. Obviously, if you need to deploy medical personnel on a very, very um, short notice, you don't want to be struggling with permits and the usual process in order to get them here and in order to get them working. And as a result, 
these uh, work permit exemption regulations provide for an exemption to non commandians uh, from part seven of the law who are recruited by the health services authority or by any private hospital to the posts of medical personnel uh, on or after commencement of these regulations. So they're exempt from uh, the work permit requirements. However, um, those medical uh, personnel shall still comply with all the other uh, relevant laws that regulate employment contracts, including the health practice law. Um, so they do need to be properly um, uh, registered and licensed as well. Um, the health services authority or a private hospital shall employ um, subject to any um, extension an exempted person pursuant to a contract for a period not exceeding the duration of these regulations. So essentially, a doctor that is in private practice here on the island can go to the uh, hospital or um, go to the HSA and say, I'm here to help. I've got the necessary medical qualifications to uh, properly respond. I've got the training. Um, however, I am on a work permit and I am concerned about the effects that's gonna have. This exemption allows for that. They can enter into a contract and um, that contract, a copy of that is then sent to work. Work will send back a stamped copy of the contract and they are allowed to, to um, carry on working. There are certain uh, additional uh, requirements in here when it comes to overseas recruitment of doctors in that sense. Um, it includes um, a requirement to remain in isolation until they are um, obviously uh, safe um, and to make sure uh, and to deal with the related matters. They're also not allowed to bring any of his or her dependents to the islands if it is somebody that is recruited from overseas. Um, if you are a doctor that uh, are helping out the HSA and the hospital in this way, then they make it clear as well that um, this is not going to affect your work permit. Um, work permits um, that you might have had immediately prior to being recruited um, and with the consent of the exempted person and the employer under the work permit shall continue in force and regulation nine of the regulations, which is the re regulations that require that you notify um, immigration about any cessation of employment shall not apply. And the exempted person's employment and work permit prior to recruitment shall not be deemed to have been terminated and may continue after expiration of the contract. So you can carry on working after the contract expires or uh, once the regulations run out. And uh, similar provisions apply to a permanent resident that may be recruited and might potentially be working outside the terms of uh, his or her residency and employment rights certificate. So bear it in mind uh, for the health services industry, obviously we have a a uh, fantastic uh, number of uh, doctors and medical personnel on Ireland and these regulations specifically allow for them to be deployed as and where necessary uh, without necessarily uh, going through the usual requirements. The next one we're going to touch upon is the Immigration Trans Transition Work Permit Regulations of 2020. And these changes the immigration regulations to 2019 revision. Again, the 2019 revision of the regulations were published pursuant to the Immigration Law of 2015. And we've already seen that that was changed to a certain extent by the Customs and Border Control uh, laws and regulations. And this is now a uh, further changes to those regulations as well. Um, some of it deals with changes to definitions. So for example, where the old uh, legislate or regulations refer to the chief immigration officer. It's now transitioning over. It refers to the director of work or an officer of work. It um, also uh, defines um, a definition. There's a new definition in here for jobs K man, which is the electronic portal established and maintained by work pursuant to section 58 of the law. When we spoke about section 58 earlier, uh, you would have seen that uh, uh, Jobs Cayman is now the new portal and it's just uh, set out in more detail here in these regulations. And then uh, regulation four, um, in the old regulations are completely um, uh, repealed and replaced by these. And regulation four sets out um, the uh, some of the specific requirements when it comes to work permit applications itself and I alluded to this uh, earlier and this deals with uh, specifically advertisements and where you've got an advertisement that's run in local newspapers as well as an advertisement that's run uh, on jobs K man 
And they make it clear again as well that an employer or prospective employer shall comply with Section 582 of the law in order to ascertain that a Kamanian, a holder of an RERC or a person otherwise legally or ordinarily resident who's ready, willing and qualified to undertake a job um, uh, is uh, properly considered and uh, is uh, sought to be authorized by the permit. Uh, in addition to complying with Section 58.2, an employer uh, who advertises a job locally uh, or overseas in written or online newspaper or other media, um, they, the content of that advertisement, uh, uh, no, excuse me, uh, the content of the advertisement used for that purpose shall be identical in substance to that which was approved for the registering of the job on Jobs Cayman. The advertisement uh, shall also be published simultaneously with the registering of the job on Jobs Cayman, and the employer or prospective employer shall submit copies of all such advertisements if the employer or prospective employer subsequently applies for a permit for that job. What that means is you've got to get your timing right. If you plan on advertising both on, uh, on Jobs Cayman as well as in other media, um, online and in newspapers, um, the um, publications need to happen simultaneously and it needs to be identical in substance. Uh, it's very, very important. You can't change the criteria between Jobs Cayman and uh, what is out there in the general world because then they can't measure uh, applicants accurately. Um, the Work Permit Board and Business Staffing Plan Board and the Director may, on the application of an employer, or a prospective employer um, in, uh, in his or her discretion waive any provision relating to advertising or registering of a job. But the employer or prospective employer must have applied for and received the waiver prior to the submission of the application. This is very important for us who deal with urgent applications. Um, as a law firm, for example, we frequently deal with uh, Queen's Council that have to come to the islands and appear in a court case where they might um, have a particular set of skills and focus on uh, particular uh, pieces of legislation. And frequently those are urgent and they need to get here on very, very short notice. What this states is uh, you are not even able to file the application for this permit and unless you have a waiver, otherwise you do need to comply with the requirements on Jobs Cayman. So if you have internal structures and if you have internal policies and the way in which you manage these types of applications, and it is something for which a waiver might be sought, then definitely put that at the top of your priority list to make sure that um, you do so uh, immediately. Um, otherwise, you'll need to start um, uh, dealing with the Jobs Cayman portal immediately as well. But obviously, that will see a 14-day period um, in order to finish um, uh, running. And then the Work Permit Board, the BSP Board, um, and the Director of Work shall not approve a Work Permit application where the remuneration package uh, that the employer or prospective employer stated in a permit application exceeds the remuneration package status in the advertisement. Um, or if the content of a local or overseas advertisement is not identical in substance to the advertisement registered on Jobs Cayman. That's important. You can't be putting advertisements out there uh, for a position for um, uh, $30,000 or so overseas and then post it for $20,000 per year, year in Cayman. That's just not going to fly. Um, so it needs to be accurate. And they use the word shall in these regulations. It means they shall not approve. The director uh, of work and the boards do not even have the discretion to approve an application uh, if there is such a, um, a distinction. So it's important to make sure that it's done right and it's done accurately. Where a commandian has applied for a position, um, the board and the director um, shall take into account uh, the following information supplied by the applicant for the work permit in the application or through Jobs Cayman. They look at the names of the app applicants, uh, of all applicants for the post, the qualifications, the working experience and the background of all the applicants, the reasons given for the choice of the successful applicant and for the refusal to employ other applicants, and the details of the employer or the prospective employer's reasons for not employing a Kamanian a person with RERC or somebody that's otherwise legally and ordinarily resident in the islands. And this uh, is uh, important. You can't just 
have a blanket uh, reason saying, well, you know, I might have had my fingers burnt in the past, so as a result, I uh, don't want to employ X, Y, and Z. That's not gonna fly. You really do need to consider every single application properly, look at the qualifications, and the board is going to do the same, and you do need to provide proper reasoning. An employer or prospective employer shall state on a work permit application whether the relevant position uh, is registered on Jobs Cayman and was uh, also advertised locally or overseas. That means you can't publish and run adverts overseas and then pretend that you didn't or um, uh, just focus on a Jobs Cayman advert. If you ran an advert uh, overseas, it needs to match Jobs Cayman and you do need to disclose it and provide copies of it. And unless an employer or prospective employer obtained a waiver, they, uh, the board um, or the delegates shall not consider an application for a work permit unless the requirements have been complied with. And um, a person who contravenes these provisions are liable for a fine of $5,000. Uh, there are certain prescribed fees that's been changed as well in the regulations. Um, the most important one for all of us is Section 58.2. The registration of a job by employers or prospective employers on jobs came in is not free. There's a $25 fee that attaches to a registration on the portal itself. Um, the next one I'm quickly going to mention is the Customs and Border Control Amendment Law. That's not important for today. It deals with Cabinet's power to give directions to the Director of um, Customs and Border Control. Moving on um, are some practical considerations when you're filing permit applications. And um, it's a constantly changing landscape. And there's the Jobs Came In portal as well. And um, over time, we've seen uh, some changes, please do bear with me. Uh, we have seen some changes over time and um, uh, we have traditionally all worked on the immigration.gov.ky website and um, referred over to work and uh, you would have seen for the last year or so there was a little um, blurb on the immigration website that stated that it's uh, transitioning into work and that is now very much happening and work.ky should be your go-to website. That's where you start your process. Um, and uh, there may be situations where you have to refer back to the immigration.gov.ky website um, as and when certain forms uh, are required. Work has updated some of their application forms. If you go to the work.ky website, um, a lot of them have a little blurb at the top uh, that says COVID-19. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, the forms have been updated to account for certain changes that's been made during these um, at times and to allow work themselves to process applications more expeditiously and to account for certain other go government departments that's been closed. The work also has um, FAQs on their website. And uh, the frequently asked questions on a website, certainly as of yesterday, I'm hoping that um, uh, it will change quickly, but as of yesterday, those were still dated the 15th of April, uh, 2020. Uh, we've spoken with work. We do expect the frequently asked questions to uh, be updated, most likely by close of business today. So please have a look at that. But bear in mind, the FAQs on the work website predates the change to the legislation that we spoke about earlier. It predates Jobs Came In. It predates um, the commencement of this legislation uh, that started on the 1st of May. So the, the FAQs definitely point you in the right direction, but um, I will highly encourage you to continue looking at the site and making sure um, that you are looking at the latest FAQs and that it uh, uh, is uh, up to date, uh, hopefully later on today. Um, it also deals with the registration uh, on Jobs Cayman. There's a link at the top of the page. And um, uh, in order to post a job on Jobs Cayman, you as employer need to be registered on Jobs Cayman. And uh, it's uh, at this point in time, a slightly arduous process. Typically you need to register an individual first and then that individual needs to be linked to the organization. Um, but there are very, very good guidance notes, uh, probably about uh, seven or eight publications that sets out every step of the way of what you need to do. And the Jobs Cayman people are working around the clock to assist people in registering and making sure that they are fully operational and that they are able to post on Jobs Cayman. So please do have a look at 
um, the guidance notes and the contact details that is on the site because it is continuously evolving. The um, work has also published certain additional guidance notes, um, and those I'm going to touch upon very, very briefly. Those were published just yesterday, yesterday or the day beforehand, um, and it deals with the submission of applications at this point in time. As we know, works offices are closed right now. There's no physical premises where you can go to in order to submit an application. So all applications are being submitted by way of email. Um, the online platform just hasn't been completed just yet, but they're working hard to get it done. And in order to um, file an application, obviously there are certain fees that are payable. And to, to that end, um, the payment needs to take place by way of electronic fund transfers. An electronic fund transfer right now is the only way in which it can be filed, uh, or rather in which you can pay. And work, uh, we spoke with them yesterday, and they are working very, very hard on getting other types of payment platforms and so up and running. But as of right now, there is a, um, a document online and that document does set out uh, where the payment needs to be made to by way of EFT and, and the descriptions. And so you need to put on there. One of the um, biggest things that you must please do when you make any sort of payment uh, via the EFT portal is to make sure that there is a very clear and concise description. Um, as to what it relates to. If it's for a work permit holder, if you know the worker reference number, fantastic, put that on as well. You will find that on the person's uh, work permit or um, give some other type of really detailed description because ultimately tre Treasury needs to be able to link the payment to this particular application. And uh, we understand uh, there has been some difficulties with that because obviously if your description on the filing just says work permit and there's a thousand others that's been filed over the last month that's also just called work permit, it becomes quite uh, an arduous process to track the money back. There are um, uh, additional uh, uh, considerations as well that was flagged by work and they do uh, ask that you have a look at these EFT payments and to make sure that it's actually gone through itself as well. There's been uh, some frustration expressed where an EFT confirmation has been sent across to work but that a payment is still pending. You will see on your EFT transfer sheet that um, if you make a payment, um, it will either state that it's pending or that it was successful. And only once it's successful will they be able to see it in their accounts and will they be able to link it properly. Uh, so uh, don't be too trigger happy and make sure that the payment is successful before sending instructions across. Otherwise, it results in additional delays. There are some additional uh, guidance notes also on the electronic submission of work permit transactions and um, uh, those can be found on the work website as well. And uh, it relates specifically to the forms for temporary work permits, temporary work permits ex extensions, the three month extensions, renewals of annual work permits, work permit amendments, permissions to continue working and work permit grants. Now, up until last week, work was still not um, accepting work permit grant applications purely because of the um, uh, operational uh, restrictions and so, but they are accepting work permit grants right now. So if you do have somebody that uh, is on a, a six month temp or even on a three month temp and they need to file a grant application, work is able to um, receive and process those applications. There are certain guidance notes on this. If you are making payments by way of US dollars and you are converting to CI dollars, you need to use a 0.82 conversion rate. The file format must be in PDF format only. Don't take uh, a ton of JPEG pictures of your documents and then upload those because it causes issues at their system and they can't physically process it. Um, additionally, work has said they are having some um, difficulties with people submitting applications where every single page has been scanned individually. If you are submitting a work permit application, um, please uh, make best effort to scan everything as a single document. There are a lot of apps and similar documents um, uh, available 
that um, allow you to consolidate these documents and preferably attach it to your emails as a single PDF file or maybe no more than two or three PDF files because um, it assists them in uploading it to their system and can sometimes be the difference between a work uh, permit administrator spending five minutes or spending an hour just dealing with administrative stuff and that obviously um, rolls into other sorts of uh, matters. Uh, the additional criteria are set out over there. In line with the COVID-19 measures, there are certain things that are not required and has not been required since the 20th of March until further notice. Those are medical questionnaires, x-rays and lab reports. Um, you also don't have to submit police clearance certificates at this point in time. You don't need to submit a police or their other photograph. You don't need to submit a cover letter, you don't need to submit an accommodation form, and you don't need to submit newspaper advertisements. All of those, um, uh, you don't have to submit, they've been waived temporarily, and a lot of that relate again to operational things. Doctors are busy and they're working under certain restrictions, so inundating them with medical questionnaires and x-rays and the lab reports just isn't practical. Police clearance certificates, uh, sim similarly, you can apply for them, but you might not be able to go collect them, photographs and so as well. Importantly, although newspaper advertisements have been waived, um, job vacancies must be published via the Jobs Cayman portal and good faith efforts to employ a Kamanian on a priority basis must still be demonstrated. So this is important. Uh, it's not all advertisements that's been waived. Um, it's only newspaper advertisements. And because since this law came into effect, jobs scamming is now mandatory, you do need to um, deal with that specifically. They do have similar um, documents and similar guidelines uh, when it comes to permanent residency applications. Uh, we've now had um, confirmation that they are accepting permanent residency applications as well as uh, permission to continue working applications. But please bear in mind that the permanent residency applications are also have um, some uh, redacted documents that are filed right now uh, purely due to the sheer sizes and volumes of these types of applications. For permanent residency applications, these are people who have been here for more than um, eight years. I'm just going to briefly refer back to the transitional provisions found in the Immigration Transition Amendment Law um, that I briefly referred to earlier. And those are for people who are um, approaching their term limits. If you've got an employee who's been here almost nine years or who's reached his nine-year term limit um, during this period, then where due to the expiration of the workers' term limit under Section 66 of the Principal Law, an employer is unable, as required by Subsection 2, to make the application for the renewal of the work permit. Obviously, if somebody reaches their term limit, you can't file a work permit application. Neither the employer nor the worker shall be deemed to have acted in contravention of the principal law or the amending law if the worker continues to work in the same terms and conditions as the final work permit between a period of 27th March and 90 days after the commencement of this amending law or any other period by which this period is extended. So what that means is if you've got somebody who reached their term limit now in um, uh, the last uh, month or so, and um, uh, you were not able to file any sort of um, applications or so, then that person can still carry on working for 90 days from the commencement of the amendment law, which is 90 days from the 1st of May onwards. Secondly, where a worker's permission to stay in the islands in accordance with section 66.4, uh, expires on or after the 27th March. And these are people who had PCWs, uh, permissions to continue working. So, um, uh, and the worker's application under section 37 of the law has not been determined yet, then that worker may continue to work after the expiration of the permission um, and shall not be deemed to be committing an offense as long as he uh, complies with subsection eight. And subsection eight essentially um, compels that person to file a PCW application within 30 days of the commencement of the amending law, meaning next week. Uh, what happened was you had somebody that filed an application for permanent residency last year, um, and uh, they reached a term limit and they filed an application for a permission to continue working. And they have been working pursuant to that PCW. The PCW is valid for six months, and that PCW has since uh, run out. 
Unfortunately, the boards have not been able to sit during this time. Um, and as a result, this person was essentially stuck in limbo. What they are saying is you're not going to be affected by that. However, you are now obliged um, to file a new PCW application um, by essentially next week in order to make sure that you remain in compliance with the law. Um, the next thing we're quickly going to touch upon is the um, work permit holders um, that can return, but they must pay isolation fees. So the government has announced that work permit holders, their spouses and their dependents will be allowed to return to the Cayman Islands on incoming flights, but they'll need to spend two weeks at an isolation facility at their own cost. Um, before the commencement, only Kamanians and permanent residents uh, could fly into Cayman while the borders remained closed and they were housed at government isolation facilities with the tab being picked up by government. Um, that practice will continue for uh, residents and, and Kamanians. Um, as has been the practice for several weeks, at the end of the 14-day period, all persons will be tested for COVID-19 and must receive a negative test result before they will be able to allow, or before they will be allowed to leave the facility. So this is something that definitely needs to be borne in mind, especially if you have work permit holders traveling in from overseas, um, because not only will they need to be housed in a government facility, but um, the tab for that um, isolation will need to be picked up. Um, I've put a few things on uh, the slideshow at the moment that are just key email addresses that we've been dealing with over the, uh, over the last number of uh, weeks. Uh, these are as of the 7th of May 2020. Uh, from time to time they do uh, update it, um, but these are the key ones that you uh, will be dealing with when you are submitting work permit applications, PR applications, uh, when you're dealing with refunds, uh, complaints, um, command and status and PR applications, general queries and so, so uh, feel free to jot those down while I carry on talking. Um, the Customs and Border Control has also issued some notices. Um, their visa counters remain closed and the extension counters remain closed. So right now uh, we do have a lot of people that are on visitor stamps and they have not been able to go to Customs and Border Control in order to um, get new stamps. Um, they are fine, um, but they are encouraged to carry on listening um, and following the media and uh, getting updates from CBC to make sure that once the visa counters are open again, they do go and get themselves regularized. There's an overstayer amnesty as well that was published by Customs and Border Control. And um, given the uncertainty in coordinating the air bridge and the evacuation flights, an amnesty has been implemented with immediate effect. Um, that, uh, this was published a few weeks ago um, against prosecution of persons for overstaying and it will remain in effect until further notice. And um, uh, just bearing in mind, there has been a few people that has uh, made use of this amnesty in order to um, leave the islands on the evacuation flights of late in, uh, without fear of prosecution. The last slide I want to talk about is permanent residency itself. Uh, we alluded to it very briefly um, a few moments ago as well. And permanent residency, these are persons who uh, are approaching their term limits or whose annual fees are due. And uh, this relates to the point system itself. Um, the point system, um, are, it's found in Schedule 2 to the regulations. And this applies to people who have been here for more than eight years. And typically it's uh, people who have been here between eight and nine years, but the law has been amended to allow people who's been here for longer than nine years uh, legally to also apply for permanent residency. The point system, it's Schedule 2 to the um, immigration regulations is very, very clear and it's a fantastic point system. It's, uh, there's a 110 point requirement and it sets out nine different factors against which each applicant is assessed. 
and it really assesses applicants on all areas of their lives. Um, the point systems have uh, been scrutinized quite a lot over the last number of years. It's still found in the Immigration Regulations 2019 revision, and it is still very much the point system as we knew it from 2015 as amended back in 2017. But it's really, it's not a system that is geared only for the rich. It is a system that really does measure applicants against all areas of their lives. And uh, the point system uh, looks, for example, at your occupation, it looks at your qualifications, it looks at your investment into the islands in uh, real estate or business as against your income, as against your actual means. Um, it also looks at um, your community involvement and the training of Kamanians and the integration into the community. It looks at where you're from, there's a test that you have to write. Um, it's a fantastic system. And um, it really is very, very well balanced and very similar to what we see in most countries. Uh, there are certain filing fees that attach to permanent residency applications. And typically for a permanent residency application, there are four fees that are payable. And those fees are a thousand dollar application fee. That one is non-refundable. Um, and uh, the next one is a dependent fee. If you do have dependents added to your permanent residency application, it's $400 per dependent. There is an issue fee of between 500 CI and 12,500 CI, depending on uh, the uh, amount of annual income that you earn. And then there's also the annual fee, which is the equivalent of your annual work permit fee. And that annual fee will continue after you um, receive a permanent residency and every single year Year, you will be required to file an annual declaration and um, uh, pay that annual fee until eventually, um, if you do so and you are eligible, you get Kamanian status. And um, permanent residents can file an application for naturalization one year after being granted permanent residency, and you can apply for Kamanian status five years after naturalization or after you've been legally and ordinarily resident on island for at least 15 years, whichever one of those comes first. Uh, we've um, uh, spoken briefly about the PCW and the PR uh, requirements as well during the shelter in place uh, provisions. So that being said, I'm aware that I've been going for quite some time already. Uh, all I have left to say is um, thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure and uh, I'm happy to uh, take some questions. Well, thank you very much. There's, there's certainly plenty of questions that have been posted to the chat. So Len, maybe we can start addressing them. Some of you, you've answered them, but maybe, maybe some people didn't hear it because it was quite a lengthy presentation. So thanks again. So let's start with some of the ones here that I see. Um, so it says here, work permit grants for uh, business staffing plan, what form should be used during COVID? Okay, um, so we just uh, spoke with work yesterday. Um, at the moment, they are accepting work permit grants, um, and I'll circle to the BSP ones right now. They are accepting work permit grants, and they are currently working on, um, uh, on new work permit grant forms. Uh, but for the time being, use the forms that are found on the old site for now, but continuously check the work.ky website um, for updates. Um, and then they are accepting BSP grants and renewals as well, uh, although they are not being processed right now um, because the board isn't sitting. Um, but uh, if the form is not on the work.ky site um, yet, if it hasn't been updated, then use the form that you've got on the immigration.gov.ky website. Okay, excellent. So there's another question. If a grant was submitted in March, where we were told the job did not have to go on jobs came in, and then on April 5th, the application was deferred because it had to be posted on jobs came in, is this allowed in, in as much as the law did not come into effect until May 1st? Um, correct. So um, that very, very first transitional provision in the um, amendment law uh, specifically deals with that. And as long as the application was submitted before the 1st of May, uh, it's fine because it still gets processed in terms of the old legislation, irrespective of whether it has been since, since been deferred because um, it is still, it's that submission date we're dealing with. It's not uh, the deferral date. 
There's a question about, can someone coming to KMAT do a blasting for a quarry company for just three days, apply under the visitor work visa? Oof, um, I'll have to have a look-see on the visitor work visa uh, requirements. Uh, they might be able to, yes. Um, go to the immigration.gov.ky website and uh, it does set out visitor work visa requirements on there and it will set out the specific criteria. Um, you know, there are certain industries and so that they do refer to, um, uh, but typically it's only professional employees that uh, will not be able to apply for a visitor work visa. Um, so typically somebody like that, that comes from an outside organization for a short period like that should be able to. Uh, if there is any sort of doubt, then um, the best thing is actually to make the application to CBC in advance and say, this is the individual, this is the flight tickets. There are specifically those requirements that do need to be provided in any event and then break down all the details and CBC responds within 24 hours and lets you know whether or not there's a yay or nay on that application. And Len, I think it's, you basically said work, uh, they are accepting work from an applications at this time, right? Yes, they are. Um, last week, this answer would have been different. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, they are accepting work permit applications at this time. Um, as we know, there were publications and there were uh, notices previously where uh, during the time where they weren't able to accept applications that you could file what they call a temporary work permit extension to essentially take a six month permit up to a nine month uh, period and extend uh, for a further three months. Uh, but now that work permit uh, grants are being accepted, that's definitely uh, what I'll recommend. And, you know, over time, this is going to change. Over time, they are updating uh, more and more forms and they are moving to a really comprehensive online platform. Um, so we see, uh, you know, we fully expect in the next few months that this is going to be a very, very slick operation um, and that they will be carrying, uh, they will be accepting all types of applications. And then what about the business staffing plan board? Uh, have they resumed meetings to consider? No. No, unfortunately not yet. None of the boards have um, started meeting yet. So uh, that includes the Commandian Status and Permanent Residency Board and the BSP Board as well. Um, however, we did have a discussion with work just yesterday. And I, as I understand that they are actively testing technology and testing the new types of resources uh, to physically allow the boards to start meeting, even though they might not be able to be in the same room together. Um, so uh, you can file BSP applications right now, but uh, they did indicate they might not be processed immediately and at the usual sort of speed that we see. Okay, and then the Jobs Cayman website, uh, is there a fee to post advertisements? Is it by post or do you have to have something by year or is there a fee at all? There is a fee, yes. Um, the very last uh, amendment to the regulations that was uh, uh, implemented uh, has a 25 CI fee uh, to post a position on Jobs Schema. Now, you know, it's uh, on the one end, uh, you, it's almost annoying to have to pay a fee, but on the other Oh, you seized up a bit. Len, um, I'm not sure your internet connection, whether you're still on. Um, again? Yep, yep, I'm back. Uh, looks like we just dropped out for a moment.
Okay, well, thanks for coming back. <laughs> All right, well, let's just come through some of these questions. There are several questions, so I'll just kind of go through them again. Are you still there? Yep, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, so, so can a work permit grant be submitted without an employee signature as for the social distancing measures? Um, the typically we will expect some form of signature so um you know you there are a lot of um, ways in which to sign a document uh, electronically or to put a signature and scan it across um so uh, it, you might not have wet ink signatures on the same page uh, but certainly we would expect signatures on those documents um, uh, to be submitted in any event so perhaps one party signs it scans it to the other one or it gets signed in counterpart and submitted uh, simultaneously. All right, and then can an employee whose term limit is up continue working until they can get a flight out as the, as the border is currently closed? Um, under the amendment regulations, the, under those pro, uh, transitional provisions, yes, they can, uh, but that's only if their term limit uh, was up since the 27th of March. Um, and only uh, for up to 90 days um, after this law took effect. So from the 1st of May onwards, there's a 90 day period within which they can carry on working. That being said, we don't want people to take advantage of that. This isn't a case of kicking back and, realize, and thinking, well, I don't have to do anything for the next 90 days. They will still be expected to make active um, uh, efforts in order to uh, be placed on an evacuation flight. But yes, somebody has reached their term limit has that 90 day window. Yeah, it's, this is an interesting question. Um, obviously, we've heard about the isolation fee when work permit holders are allowed to come back in. The question is, who is responsible to pay for the isolation fee for <laughs> holders? Uh, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Um, that's unclear, isn't it? It, it, it's, I haven't looked into it into, in detail, um, and I'm hesitant to put a definitive answer on it. Uh, right. Just, you know, generally, uh, the law is drafted in such a way that work permit fees itself is responsibility of the employer. Uh, whether or not something like this that is an operational consideration and something like this that is mandatory um, is by law that uh, employer's responsibility I'm unsure, I haven't looked into it, yeah. but you know, from a practical point of view, uh, who's to blame over here? Uh, is it an employee that traveled intentionally, uh, knowing full well that they might not be able to come back? Or is it uh, a new hire where it, it, it will be the employer's responsibility really to uh, just realize that these costs is something to consider and they, that they will need to bear in mind in terms of determining whether or not it is worth bringing somebody here at this point in time. So there's some employers that actually have uh, received the business visit visitors permits. And they, I guess the question deals with, uh, then they were not able to be used as uh, this is uncertain when they will be able to be used them during the remainder. Um, <laughs> can those be refunded? Um, let me, there was a change to the regulations that specifically dealt with um, uh, refunds. And so if you give me a second, I can see whether or not I can pull it up. Uh, but uh, typically there is provisions, yes, to allow for uh, refunds in cases where a uh, permit was not uh, specifically used. Two seconds. There is. And while you're looking at that, I have a couple of other probably simpler questions. Um, uh, you know, you, I think we've already answered, you already answered this about how you handle annual work permit fees. There's a, the online portal, you can pay them that way, right? Um, the uh, fees right now, the only way in which you can pay them is by EFT, by electronic fund transfer. Right. Um, the, unfortunately, there's no other method by which you can pay that's available right now. Again, that was something that was raised when we did speak with work yesterday, and they are actively working on alternative options, essentially looking into an online portal or looking into the ability for people to go and make a direct deposit at um, RBC, but that hasn't been implemented yet and they are feverishly working on it. They do recognize that 
and there are some operational constraints obviously when it comes to that but right now it's EFTs or nothing if you don't have EFT capabilities then it's you will need to just deal with the logistics and reach out to somebody that might be able to make the transfer for you and um, transfer the funds over or something along those lines I'll let you talk about the, the okay yeah um, it's literally that question relates to the one part of the amendment regulations uh, that I did not <laughs> highlight earlier and that relates to prescribed fees so they say specifically where a work permit was approved on or after the 1st of March 2020 um, and it ceases to be effective for whatever cause before the worker named in it has arrived in the islands to take up the employment authorized by the permit or where the worker named in it is in the islands but has not commenced employment as authorized by the work permit. Um, then the employer shall, where the employer submits a written declaration to work that the worker named in the permit has not taken up his or her employment in the period between granting of the permit and its cessation, be entitled to a refund of all prescribed fees in relation to that work permit, except for the application fee. So you're not going to get the application fee back, but you will get the other fees back. And there is, I'm just paging back here, when it comes to liaising with work, there's a specific web uh, email address that immaccountsourpayable uh, at gov.ky uh, that's to be used for these refund requests. So there's a question about are the return work permit holders, uh, all, does that only apply to those who were previously on island or can it include new hires as well, i.e. Um, locating for the first time of employment on island? We have not seen any indication that it is limited only to um, returning work permit holders. And um, we've also not seen any indication that work I will not be accepting new work permits for people that are off island. You know, there are considerations obviously during this time about physically approving those permits. Um, but uh, from, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it's not only limited to returning work permit holders. If you've got a permit, you're legally allowed to come here. Um, so whether or not it is as a returning work permit holder or as a new work permit holder, the same should apply. Um, but I will definitely recommend that people do reach out to um, the relevant authorities to see whether or not they will be able to get a place on the plane itself. However, you know, if, based on what we're seeing, they are allowed to, um, but there might be on the ground considerations. I am aware of one or two situations over the last few weeks where people had difficulties getting a spot on the plane, um, and that will need to be looked into in a little bit more detail. So another practical question. Um, if new employees have to go into 14 days quarantine, does the work permit have to start from the day they arrive? or two weeks later when they actually start work? <laughs> that, is a, that is a very, very good question. Um, the, you can make an application to work for a work permit uh, commencement day to be pushed back, uh, but uh, you still need these people to arrive on island legally. Um, so I suppose there is an argument to be made that uh, you can ask for the commencement date to only take effect after they leave quarantine, uh, but uh, they will then face other considerations. They will then need to arrive on island essentially as visitors and need to be passed through uh, CBC in that way and properly stamped and regularized right. and then enter the facility. You know, having the physical work permit, I uh, expect a pragmatic approach and that they will see these people are arriving and that the employment will commence. Uh, but uh, it's for the sake of two weeks, I probably won't uh, venture down that avenue if it was me personally making the application. Yeah. So when is the 90 days for the term limit effective from March or May? May. So that's effective from the uh, first, let me just quickly ch uh, check. So they say um, it's uh, and 90 days after commencement of this amending law. So it's 90 days from the uh, 1st of May. Right. And I think you may have answers, but the only way you can pay fees really is through the portal, right? But um, are we, it says one of the questions, are required to submit annual PR fees, permanent resident fees, and work permit fees? 
Yes, you are. Um, it's um, uh, on those guidance notes that immigration published on the work or that work published on their website as well. One of the things they do mention over there specifically is the annual fees. Um, so yes, in cases like that, you do still need to pay the fees on time and you then email uh, the payment receipt across to uh, the relevant, whether it's for work permits or PR submissions uh, in order to provide evidence of that. So yeah. So and then the next question is, what's the process of dealing with permanent resident appeal refusals? Oof, um, uh, that's, that's a tricky process right now um, because the Immigration Appeals Tribunal is not sitting right now. Uh, from what I understand, the, um, uh, the people are not able to submit appeals at this point in time, but uh, the, you know, for for fear of trying to dodge a question, um, I would definitely recommend that somebody in that situation takes legal advice because the 28-day um, period under the law has not necessarily stopped running uh, simply because the board is closed um, and because they can't accept applications right now. So um, when you go through the appeal process, let's say you do get your application submitted, then it's all set out in the law itself. And there is a, typically you need to provide a notice of appeal and then you need to file your um, uh, grounds of appeal. And um, they will then look at those initial grounds and immigration or other work that uh, Command and Status and Permanent Residency Board will then write back and they will give you full reasons in writing for the refusal of the immigration or of the permanent residency application itself. And those reasons will literally set out how much they scored you in every single one of the categories and how many points they got um, uh, when they calculated where you're at. Um, and they, uh, the IET needs to make sure that your application is not speculative. So they do really scrutinize it very, very carefully um, to make sure it's not just somebody that's filing an appeal for the sake of trying to buy more time, but it does meet the criteria under the law and there is a genuine um, issue that needs to be reviewed. Um, and then once you've got those reasons, you can file your substantive grounds of appeal to um, the uh, tribunal and they will then hear the appeal. Now, previously we were still heard in person um, at the tribunal. Nowadays, we submit all our arguments and so on the papers and it's heard um, by the tribunal in that way. And we can you know, obviously make requests to be heard in person. Uh, but yeah, from a practical point of view, uh, the requirements still apply um, and there is a very, very strict structure set out on the law um, as to how an appeal works and what timelines you need to comply with when it comes to filing your initial notice and then filing um, uh, eventually, you know, going through the steps and getting to the substantive grounds. So it says one of our employees left the island in April. His permit is through till next year. Should I cancel it? Where should I send this email? Um, so uh, uh, on this page uh, that's I've, that I've got on the screen right now as well, uh, look at cancellations that WP cancellations at gov.ky. So use that to notify um, work of the cancellation. And so there's a question about those uh, advertising on the work for those positions. Uh, I don't know if it's clear, but how long um, for that $25 that you have to, how long is that good for? Um, that's not clear. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. We do know that uh, traditionally uh, work permit adverts in newspapers were valid for uh, three months. And if you were dealing with BSPs, it was valid, I think, it, if I remember correctly, six months. Um, I'm not sure. I generally don't know. Uh, it's something that we'll need to look into in more detail, but I am aware of the fact that we do have employers um, that have multiple employees that are employed in the same position and have exactly the same uh, terms and conditions as it were. Um, I would expect it to probably be valid for the same sorts of periods, three or, six, uh, three or six months, but it's something that we hope will be set out in additional guidance notes um, as it's published. There's so many different circumstances. It's amazing, these questions. So what will happen to someone who left the island in March and the border closed and his permit expires in July? <laughs> how, can, how can it be renewed? That's um, so they left in March. 
the border yep. closed and the permit expires in July. July. And I assume this is an application for somebody who, um, uh, where they do want to apply, uh, renew the work permit itself. Yes, yeah, so it must it must be like that. Yeah, and his permit expires in July, so he already has a permit. Um, in that case, you're going to go through the normal work permit renewal process. The only thing that really changed for you is the fact that that person is not physically on island right now. Um, you know, he might not be able to work, but if he's still on a work permit and he's still employed by this business, uh, then the fact that he's off island doesn't ab absolve him from the work permit requirements. If that person's employment is terminated, obviously you have a requirement to immediately uh, notify a uh, work, uh, but the, if they are still employed and they're just not physically able to get back right now, then yes, come July, um, you will need to file a renewal application before that permit expires. And uh, as and when they're able to return to the island, then we will expect them to have to enter the isolation facility uh, for at least 14 days. Yeah, this is an interesting one, um, Alain. I mean, it said I registered my company on the jobs came in at the immigration office in January. Everything has been going great. There was never any mention of a fee, which leads me to believe that this is something new. It is new. NWDA has never required a payment when that was being used. So I guess, I guess the government's trying to capture some income to maintain this jobs portal. And for it now it's that $25 uh, fee, right? So I guess it is. it's not backdated though. It's going forward from when the when, we're, when the legislation came into effect. Correct, right? yeah. So this, uh, this fee was introduced in this immigration transition work permit regulations. Um, and um, uh, that was published on the 1st of May. And it's literally uh, the amendment to schedule one, part two and part three of those regulations. And it specifically includes um, the amendment to section 58. And registration of a job by employer or prospective employer on jobs came in is $25. It is something I have ha heard mentioned over the last while because of um, uh, the transition between NWDA and what and jobs came in itself. But people do need to bear in mind this is something that um, has been coming for a very, very long time. And it is uh, something that is going to very much formalize and regularize the way in which permits are dealt with going forward. Um, and it is a structure that is in place, not just temporarily, but it is, this is the structure we've been talking about for the last decade. Right. Um, so yes, there's a fee that attaches to it. There might not have been one earlier this year, um, but that might have just been because it was the initial implementation phases while they were, while they were still rolling it out and up until the point where they um, made it mandatory. Yeah, and there's a lot of people asking how you pay that fee. And again, it comes back down to, it's, it's on the um, online portal, right? So there's a payment section there that that's where you pay the fee, right? I'm correct, yeah. So you'll need to follow the guidance on the Jobs Cayman uh, site. To, um, I'm not sure if Jobs Cayman has its own online portal just yet or whether or not it's just EFTs. I'll need to look into it into a little bit more detail. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, Work might have an update on those payments uh, online or I certainly expect something to uh, come out very shortly, hopefully yeah. with the FAQs later today. They're really going to have to get that sorted because like the next question I ask is the fee pay before or after the post. So I mean, the reality is like anything else. If you're going to post something, you have to pay when you post. Yeah, so, I expect it to be before the post. Um, unfortunately, I don't know, but um, I don't expect it will be a payment after the fact. It might be that they set up something similar uh, to what we see with uh, Chorus and Cap and those sorts right. of platforms for companies where maybe a, uh, they will set it up so that a company has an account and whatever you post can just be deducted from that. Um, but as of right now, it's still early days and I'm not sure at which time that payment gets taken. Yeah, they're not, they're not, according to another one of our participants in this call, it says, um, can, can payments to work have to be processed as a domestic wire from Butterfield or RBC? I don't see them listed as a pay on Butterfield. I have posted two jobs two days ago and there was no fee. So obviously they're still in the process of putting that in place. Yeah, absolutely. So right now, right now, the literally. Law, the, uh, yeah, the, the law, I think, uh, preempted the law kind of set the stage for the fee, but they're not ready to accept it yet. 
Correct. Correct. So right now, um, unfortunately, EFTs, electronic fund transfers, really is the only option. Uh, we obviously hope that they will be set up as a payee on the various online banking systems shortly, um, but not just yet. So again, this is a labor question. Uh, are we allowed to reduce employees' hours and pay? And do they need a new contract to do this? Or is an amendment to the contract sufficient? Uh, typically, an amendment to the contract will be sufficient. Yes, it is contractual. Um, and yes, there are operational considerations. We have at our firm uh, seen these types of uh, matches over the last month. And so, especially in, for example, the um, food services or tourism industries where um, people are on reduced hours, but they still need to survive. And then uh, the parties do enter into amendment agreements, typically what we refer to as a temporary amendment or a temporary adjustment to the remuneration package um, to allow for something like that. But yes, uh, every single time, make sure that there is a proper contractual agreement between you and your staff. And you do need to bear in mind as well that uh, minimum wage legislation and requirements has not stopped applying during this time. So. Um, you can't suddenly start paying somebody $3 per hour uh, full-time work uh, during this period. All right. Well, I think we're, I think we're a bit over two hours now, and I'd like to thank everyone for participating. And, and certainly, Len, I mean, you probably need a glass of water right now. Anyway. <laughs> I've got a really big one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd certainly like to thank you and your firm for everything you've done for this uh, webinar. I really appreciate it very much. And all the people um, on the call definitely have. There are so many questions, and we're not going to be able to answer all of them. Um, but I will say to everybody that uh, the Chamber is hosting another webinar um, on the 27th of May, and that's with the law firm Harneys. And that's the 13th in a series of these webinars. And they will be covering the topic for that one is debt restructuring. So if your businesses are having some struggles and understanding how to restructure, uh, that's probably the webinar for you to, to, to tune into. So that's on the 27th of, of May. And, and again, I hope that everyone on this call um, really finds these webinars useful. We, we are trying our best to make them interesting for you while you're still in um, some quarantine, not quarantine, but um, you know, shelter in place provisions. But um, at the end of the day, as the economy opens, I hope people will still be attentive to these webinars as we continue them or until the chamber gets our training center opening up again once the social distancing practices are confirmed. So Len, I'd just like to say again, thank you for your time and I hope everyone has a good day and a good weekend. And remember that this session will is recorded and will be posted to the chamber COVID updates.ky website along with um, Len's presentation. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you all.